In 2007, the controversy arrived in full force in the town of Morro Bay, California. A year earlier, Charles Lynch, a former software engineer, had opened a dispensary called Central Coast Compassionate Caregivers, the only medical marijuana facility within 100 miles. For years, Charles says he suffered from debilitating migraine headaches and drove long distances for the drug. I decided that we kind of needed one in our local area, not just for me, but for uh, our patients or the, the patients in our, in our area. Charles's dispensary had the approval of the local city council and the town mayor, Janice Peters. It was very discreet. Anyone passing by would hardly know it was there. Lynch was asked to join the Chamber of Commerce, and for a time, business ran smoothly. So you felt you were doing everything by the book according to state law? Oh, yes, I felt, I felt definitely so. Mayor Peters agreed that Lynch ran a tight ship, and she never had a problem. I personally went around to every single business around the dispensary, gave them my card, said, call the police too, but please call me if anything concerns you or upsets you about this business. And I never had a single call in the almost year that they were there. But one of Charles's patients, Owen Beck, was 17 when he came to Charles's dispensary with his dad. I vomited literally four times a day. Owen Beck was diagnosed with bone cancer his senior year of high school and began six rounds of rigorous chemotherapy. It's just terrible, terrible, just disgusting feeling all the time. They tried to give me medication for, you know, painkillers and all kinds of stuff, but no nothing really worked. Owen says he couldn't keep the pills down. His doctor recommended medical marijuana, and Owen talked about it with his dad. He was very open to it. He just put every, all political views aside and was just, you know, this is my son. He needs to get better. So I think we should try anything that we're, that's going to work. Owen says he'd smoke four times a day and noticed the change immediately. It was the only thing that alleviated any of my symptoms. The nausea would go away. Um, I'd be able to eat a small meal, get some nutrition for the day. Um, it, would, it would relax me, basically. A short time later, Owen says medical marijuana became even more of a necessity when he had to have his leg amputated. The phantom pain is actually the worst. It basically feels like nails are just being nailed into your entire leg. It's like the worst experience I've ever had in my life. But the marijuana did numb the pain a lot. But back in Morro Bay, medical marijuana would soon become temporarily unavailable. Early one morning in 2007, Charles called up his secretary at the dispensary to tell her he was running late. She was frantic. She was uh, telling me, Charlie, they're here. And I says, what? Authorities arrested one of Charles's employees for selling marijuana to undercover police agents miles from the dispensary, something Charles says he knew nothing about. Seconds later, Charles heard banging at his front door. And they says, search warrant, open up, search warrant. And I, you know, I, my heart just dropped and started pounding. And they says, open the door we're gonna bang it down you know and so i opened the door and about 15 guys with uh, machine guns bulletproof vests came barreling in through my door and uh, they put put me on the ground there with a, a gun to my head so the dea was raiding it was banging on your door the same time they were raiding your dispensary right it was a simultaneous raid deputies carried boxes of evidence out of the dispensary around 2 30 this afternoon the DEA would not comment on what was inside them. Back at Charles's house, he was handed a search warrant. Well, actually, after I read the search warrant, I kind of felt like they were hoping to find a big, huge grow operation in my house. So I found a little bit of relief there. The DEA walked away with Charles's computer, his personal medical marijuana supply, and $27,000 he had in the house. But Charles wasn't arrested. And like many other dispensaries who were raided before, he reopened a short time later. In hindsight, do you think maybe it would have been better if you just shut down? Well, actually, I felt like I had a lot of people depending on me. There was definitely a, you know, a big question in my mind whether I should reopen, and I went to the city attorney of Morro Bay. He had told me that it, it, you know, that it was okay for me to reopen. The reopening was short-lived. Charles says the DEA called his landlord and told him he risked having his property seized. And so Charles was forced to close his dispensary for good. You figured that's it, you're done. Right, and the dispensary was closed. I was, uh, you know, looking for a new, new uh, job, a new project. 
But just as Charles was looking for a fresh start, the DEA and local sheriff came knocking again. They told me to step outside, told me I was under arrest for, uh, you know, ma distribution of marijuana on the federal level. Kramer, I know you're a little nervous right now, but it's going to be okay. okay. Charles was charged with cultivating and conspiracy to distribute marijuana, operating a drug premises, and selling to minors. His family put up $400,000 in bail while he awaited trial in an ankle bracelet for the next nine months. So the, the, the charges against you, you know, the government brings pretty serious. They said you sold marijuana to 250 minors, that you made $2.1 million in, in less than a year. Actually, can I address those one at a time okay. as you go? My rules from the city were, you know, 18 or older unless accompanied by a parent. Mm -hmm. Okay, but under federal law, I found out that anybody under 21 is considered a minor. And so they used that law, they used that against me to make it sound like I was down on the streets in front of the schoolyard selling ma marijuana to minors. As for the $2.1 million, Charles doesn't deny that might have been his gross proceeds from the business, but he says he never profited from his dispensary, which would have been a violation of state law. He says the $2.1 million number didn't account for any of his expenses, like paying for the marijuana, payroll, and rent. But the number of customers, particularly young people, buying marijuana didn't sit right with the local sheriff. San Luis Obispo County uh, has a population of about 260, 63,000 people. We had over 2,000 individuals that were going to this uh, facility under the auspices of needing uh, medicinal marijuana. We had over 270 minors, uh, individuals under the age of 21. Those large numbers based on our population just seemed to be out of whack. At Charles's trial, Owen Beck, now in remission, was a character witness, but his testimony was cut short when he mentioned medical marijuana. The judge had ruled such evidence irrelevant under federal law. They uh, didn't allow us to uh, talk about the California state laws that allowed me to do this. They didn't allow us to talk about my business license or the, uh, the 18 or older stuff. Um, they Actually, they didn't let us talk about a lot of things. So you, do you feel like you got a fair trial? Well, I don't think there was anything fair about federal court. After a two-week trial, the jury reached a verdict. I just couldn't believe it. Charles Lynch was found guilty on all counts. The majority of us felt like he was a nice man with um, good intentions who didn't stay within the parameters of the federal law. Charles faced five to 85 years in prison. You know, they could take me away in cuffs right then and there. You know, my car will be sitting in the parking lot. My house will be, you know, the way I left it. I'll lose everything if they take me to jail that day. It's the fall of 2008. And Charles Lynch is weeks away from sentencing for selling marijuana at his dispensary in Morro Bay, California. Thank you for two, man. Standing up for Right us. on. Thanks, man. Thank you. Here at a medical marijuana expo, he's among supporters. I wish you well. You All right. That, thank you. Friend. Appreciate it. I wish it. you well. And in front of the federal courthouse... If they can take Charles Lynch, they can take anyone standing in this crowd. So we have to take True. a stand, and we need Charles True. to have another day in court, a fair day in court. We need a new trial for Charles Lynch. Woo! You know, I've never been an activist or nothing like that. It's a civil war against us, the people... But uh, it is great to see people making signs and uh, chanting, you know, from that was definitely a, a great day for me. But Charles says the last few months have taken their toll. I'm about to lose my house. It's been difficult finding work. My financial um, situation is beyond bankruptcy. As Charles nervously awaits his fate, he sees one glimmer of hope, a change of administration. I'm kind of optimistic that, uh, you know, uh, with a new, uh, a new president, uh, hopefully uh, in the coming weeks, in the coming months that there may be a policy change at the federal level regarding uh, states' rights. That's all for this edition of Al Roker Reporting. I'm Al Roker.